Welcome to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis, and my guest today is Matt Dupuy, who's the chief of the Red Rock Indian Band. Welcome, Matt. Yes, welcome. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So let's start a little bit around your background. Where did you grow up, Matt? Tell us a little bit about your, er about your early days. Well, I was born in Nipigon, Ontario, uh, so 115 kilometers heading east. Uh, my family is all from there, both my mother and father's side. Uh, so I grew up as a most normal uh, uh, North Shore uh, kids. Lots of the outdoors, hunting, fishing, hockey was a big part of life, curling. Um, I went to I went away a couple times, just once for university, came back and moved out to Calgary for a year during the busy times in uh, the early 2000s, and then came back. I've spent, um, I've probably lived in Thunder Bay for around six years uh, intermittently, and but I've been, I've been living in Nipigon full-time now since uh, 2014. So every time I've tried to, uh, I guess you could say escape the north, <laughs> it seems to pull me back just as fast, and I can't see myself leaving anytime soon. So uh, what did you uh, study at university? I took business at the University of Windsor. Right on. Mm. So you come back in 2014 and you start getting involved in politics right away? Or how did that? Uh, actually, in 2014, I moved uh, to Nipigon and started a, um, a property management company. So over my time in Thunder Bay, I had a couple of houses that I ended up purchasing uh, uh, with my mother that we started a rental company. And then when I moved to Nipigon, I myself went out and purchased some houses that we started getting into the rental market for during the construction of the Nipigon River Bridge and different other infrastructure projects in the area. Um, shortly after that, I actually purchased a small takeout restaurant that I ran for a couple of seasons on the reserve, on Lake Helen Reserve. And then in 2015, in November, that's when I entered the political arena. And it's been uh, an interesting game ever since then. Well, when I heard that you had a shop that sold ice cream, I thought, Jeez, I wonder if they'll bring me an ice cream. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, last <laughs> June I ended up selling it uh, to uh, to a local man, and actually he's he's really taken it and run with it. I'm really proud that uh, that someone's taken that that business and grown it, because now he, he's even putting in um, a mini golf there. So just neat to see the the entrepreneurial mind in him. So I, and when I got into politics, that's when I had to start cutting back on my other responsibilities because. I never knew how much of a full-time commitment it was. Well, let's talk about that. So why did you decide to get involved in politics in 2015? Well, for me, uh, the timing was right. I, I knew that there was a lot of um, activity going to be happening um, in the area. And um, I was always one of those ones where if the timing was right and if it felt right, I mean, being a more spontaneous person, I just jumped in and did it. And... Uh, you know, I remember my first day walking in the office and uh, getting the tour and getting to my office and sitting there going, oh, oh my, what did I get myself <laughs> into? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but it took a lot of reading, a lot of time to catch up and find out exactly what was going on. And uh, I mean, I have to say that that, was the, the, that first day was the start of an incredible journey. So what were your hopes when you decided to, to get involved with politics? Uh, did you have goals or aspirations around that? Uh, yeah, I wanted to see um, I wanted to see positive interaction, positive positive change to create a lot of opportunity. I mean, in in my own uh, hometown and home reserve, um, I grew up. I mean, in the in the eighties when things were pretty busy, all the uh, the mills were booming. I mean, the population was doubled, if not tripled, in the area. And uh, I wanted to see that again. I wanted to see this area revitalize and all of my, I mean, all the people that I grew up with start to come back because there was so much opportunity in, uh, in our area. There's, I mean, there is now. And I guess when I moved to Calgary, one of the reasons why I did that was that's where all my friends were. Because mm -hmm. I mean that that's where all the work was. Yep. So it's neat now to be a part of this and uh, and seeing the positive change, the positive growth, and a lot of now my my own friends coming back and moving home. 
So, you know, you're talking about the mills and uh, closing down. So there was the paper mill in Red Rock, which mm -hmm. is closed and done. There was the plywood mill in, in Nipigon, which burned down mm -hmm. and never rebuilt. You know, this is really, in a way, a, a lot of the story of many of our small communities mm -hmm. uh, throughout the north, kind of one industry towns, and, and what do we do? Mm -hmm. So the Red Rock uh, Indian Band is just it's almost a stone's throw across the river from Nipigon. Mm -hmm. Where are those opportunities coming from now? A lot of it's, I mean, multiple sectors. I mean, uh, transmission development, I mean, with the east-west ties, a big one that's coming up. Uh, mining is starting to get very active in this area again, and even the forestry industry. I mean, I've, uh, I've been up and down the North Shore quite a bit over the past uh, few months, and it's really neat to go through places like, say, White River, for an example, something that was so quiet. I mean, when that mill went down, and I mean, it turned into almost a ghost town, and now, I mean, it seems like every next time I drive by it, there's a new business that has popped up, and more and more people, you can't get hotel rooms. I mean, uh, everything's starting to build at once. I mean, even to the north of us in Geraldton, you're uh, looking at Greenstone Gold Mine starting. I mean, the, the twinning of the highways. There's just been so much activity that, uh, that it's really, I mean, this whole area is alive again. So, you know, most of what we've talked about are time-limited jobs. Mm -hmm. Construction on the transmission line or, uh, you know, the forest industry can be a longer term, right. but even those we've seen uh, that boom and bust cycle. Yes. Have you thought about that? How, how does that play into really the strength of the community? Well, I mean, there's, there's two different ways to look at it. I mean, construction, yeah, being, I mean, once the construction's done, then the, the jobs are done. Another thing that comes out of it, especially with, um, I mean, electrical infrastructure is operations and maintenance. Uh, we're seeing in this area the skilled workforce being a, an aging workforce. So there is a lot of room still like <laughs> for, <me. laughs> for people to, to get involved in these, uh, in these operations. But uh, you know, other, other things too is there's a lot of, there's a lot of indiv individuals that would still like the idea to be a nomadic worker. I mean, may live in Nipigon, but they might go work here for the East West Thai. They might go up to the Northwest when they're building the Watina Kiniap project. So there's, a, there's, there's that, those options as well. Being centralized in an area, I mean, whether it's Thunder Bay, Nippy, and Terrace Bay, you name it, I mean, you've got the flexibility to be able to go to multiple places. So, I mean, a lot of it uh, we're seeing as, yeah, potentially could be a, a job deficit down the road when construction's done, but when you're replacing people in other jobs because of the aging workforce, we're not seeing that to be an issue. Mm -hmm. And And, has the thought about okay a mobile workforce what happens to the family if if that tradesman and that's mm -hmm. who usually they are or, or off uh, how, do, how do we support the family does that come into the thinking or the discussion um you know i can't see that it's come into any of the my discussions i mean you see it right now even uh for people that work at either lactazil mine or muscle white whether they're one week in one week out at least they're close and they can get home. Mm -hmm. I mean, when the mill, I know when the mill in Red Rock closed and the mill in Nipigon burnt down, a lot of people were moving out west. And if you were one week in, one week out, how much of that off time are you spending traveling just to get home? Mm -hmm. So it will improve the quality of life at home because of the fact that the work is so close. Right I mean, a lot of these tradesmen, I mean, if they want to get into those type of industries, that is the lifestyle. They aren't a Monday to Friday uh, job, so. At least this way, I mean, the people that are local in and around the North Shore, they will have the opportunity to be very close to their work. Uh, Matt, we need to take a short break. Uh, please stay with us, and we're going to find out a little bit more about the development up on the North Shore. Welcome back to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis, and my guest today is Matt Dupuy, who's the chief of the Red Rock Indian Band. Welcome back. Yes, thank you. So we were talking really about economic development, and you've really kind of taken a lead on this kind of building partnerships from what I understand, um, linking the training, the employment, the funding for those programs so that folks from your community and the North Shore 
can take advantage of the economic development more than maybe what was done in the past. Yes. What brought you to that? Tell, give me some background on that. Um, well, there's been, there's been other projects in the past um, that have come up, and, and uh, so training, training programs were initiated and done, but uh, what ended up happening when it came to actual a project happening, like use, for an example, uh, the Little Jackfish hydroelectric project in north of Lake Nipigon, and um, that project never happened. So it created kind of a bad taste within regards to training. Mm -hmm. So when, I mean, with the program we just did with Supercom for the East-West tie, that was different. That was a government mandated project with a set in service date. So it created a lot more stability of the, I mean, heck, this is gonna happen. So when we looked at it as for Supercom, which was a partnership with the six First Nations along the East-West tie, we said, well, we've gotta get ahead of this. Because the only way we're going to get people, um, our people, our local people, into these positions is they have to be trained. So we built a, a training program tailored to the start of construction. So it, that worked out, I mean, really well. I mean, we, we, we lobbied the provincial and federal governments to be able to get the funding for it and recruited um, a few hundred people from around the region that wanted to participate. And when I'm saying region, I'm saying all northwestern Ontario not just the members of those six First Nations, members of all other First Nations, Métis members, non-Indigenous. Everyone had the opportunity to participate in this because the only way that we were able to grow, or the only way we're going to be able to grow a new sustainable workforce is by integrating our own people, our own local people, because or else it's gonna be like other projects where a project happens with a set construction date, come in with all out-of-town workforce, do the job, go home and nothing's left for the region, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> did you involve, uh, was the, the construction companies, I'm not exactly sure how it, how it works out, involved in, in developing the training program? Yes, uh, all the companies that are gonna be involved were a part of developing the training program and a lot of them were the trainers, because mm -hmm. the idea was, was that they were being, grooming their own future staff and it worked out very well because the project was delayed. So a lot of these employers that are now going to be constructing the East-West Tie, well, they had to work elsewhere. So, I mean, there was a lot of retention right off the top just to get people to work. And the idea is the same thing when this construction project comes to an end. These are local companies that aren't going anywhere. They're gonna still need that skilled workforce. So that goes back into that whole uh, continuation piece of employment post-construction. So did, in, in, in your envisioning around the training and, and, you know, lining up employees for the job, did you think about kind of the demographics of the community? I, I've been an advocate for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. 30 years ago, I worked at the March of Dimes in employment, and we targeted the government office moving down on Red River Road uh, and developed a training program, and a number of the people that got trained are still working there 30 years later. Yes. Um, that was for people with disabilities. Do you think about the different demographics and, and targeting women or indigenous folks, or oh. how did you view that? Oh, absolutely. The one thing that, I mean, through different, uh, different organizations, like for, say, for the Red Rock Indian Band, we're a part of Anishinaabek Employment and Training Services which is a local delivery mechanism for, for um, training to employment dollars. So, I mean, we've done multiple programs in the past. I referenced the Little Jackfish. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we did learn from was past mistakes. Mm -hmm. There's always barriers out there, whether it's for people with disabilities, uh, addictions, remoteness. You know, I could say for, for myself, I mean, being the chief of the Red Rock Indian Men, and so we're the governing body for also the Lake Helen Reserve. Remoteness is not an issue for us. I mean, we're right on the highway, we're close to Thunder Bay, but as further you go down the line, a lot of those places are becoming more and more remote. Mm -hmm. So we had to work with all the different agencies to make sure that barriers were thought of before than after. So we did take more of a proactive approach to it, uh, making sure that childcare wasn't an issue, transportation, accommodation, all those different things. Of even the first part of our training program was all done either in towns or on reserve instead of pulling people out of their homes mm -hmm. and bring them to Thunder Bay. Mm -hmm. So, they, and we also had advisors all along all those six First Nations that were involved. So then that way that there was a personal approach to it. 
you weren't a number, you were an individual. So uh, that really worked. And having that, that sustainability throughout there, so some people going through this, it's their first time, this is their first job. And some of them weren't, you know, in their teens or 20s, some of them in their 30s or 40s. Mm -hmm. So being able to really work hard on that, working with the social service departments, and uh, it worked out really well. So you had a lot of players mm -hmm. involved here. Oh my gosh, I'm kind of going, how do you, how do you manage? How do you keep that everybody together heading in the same direction? Keeping the same vision. I mean, the, the vision was the individuals. I mean, making sure that what's best for them. I mean, each one of them had, I mean, the, all knew which individual we're working with. So they had that, that uniform approach to it. So we were always looking out for the best interest of the individual. And when you're looking out for the best interest of hundreds of individuals, it, you're looking out for the best interest of the region. So personally, you had your fingers in a number of the, the different groups there. Like mm -hmm. you were on the board of Anishinaabe training or education and training. Mm -hmm. um, you're a counselor in the Red Rock Indian Band. You've been working in other kind of business areas as well. Um, did you ever get any sleep? <laughs> Uh, yeah, good point. Good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? The neat thing is they're all linked. I mean, when I first started and got elected into politics, I mean, it was as a counselor. And yeah, I served as the president of, of, of AETS for a couple of years. And then also, I mean, right now I'm the chairman of board for Supercom. And, uh, but they're all linked to the same thing. I mean, all these different projects. I mean, you're looking at, I mean, revenue is revenue, looking out for the best interest to be able to create self-sustaining revenue for a First Nation but also looking at creating the best interest for the individuals. So, I mean, they were all, they all dovetailed together quite well. It just became a lot more interesting when my position as being a counselor ended up changing to becoming the chief, so. Right, so it, tell me a little bit about more about Supercom, you just mentioned that. What, what is that? So Supercom was a corporation that was created by the six First Nations that were proximate to the East West High. So that being Fort William First Nation, Red Rock Indian Band, Pace Platte, uh, Victagong, Nishtabek, or Pick River uh, First Nation, uh, Pick Mobert, as well as Mishpacotton. So they came together and they actually uh, negotiated with the proponent being Nexbridge to be equity owners in the line. So then they looked at it as well going, well, how do we maximize uh, the benefit during construction to be able to create things like we're talking about, mm -hmm. the jobs, training, and that's when they created Supercom to go after that part of it, was the economic activity during construction. So there's board reps from each of the six First Nations that comprise Supercom and we eventually had staff and now we're operating as our own sole corporation. So does Supercom have an ownership position in the, the, the tie line? Supercom, no. no, but the six First Nations do under an equity ownership uh, corporation called Bam Kushwada. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah, two separate ones. Okay. One's for ownership and, and operations of line, and then the other one's just for construction. All right, we gotta take another short break. Uh, please stay with us and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis, and my guest today is Matt Dupuy, who is the chief of the in, uh, Red Rock Indian Band. So, uh, Matt, we were just uh, talking in the last se segment around kind of building capacity uh, to participate in the economic development, particularly mm -hmm. around the East-West High Line. And, and you mentioned that something changed when you went from being a, a counselor to chief. Tell me a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So before, I mean, when I was uh, a counselor, I mean, I had a set portfolio that I looked after. I mean, economic development, um, our business development, uh, employment and training, and I, I kind of just lived in that box, and those were the things that I worked on. And yeah, in June of uh, last year, um, our chief, Ed Wawi, ended up winning the election for the, the deputy grand chief for the Robinson Superior region, and so it meant in, under our custom that I moved up into the chief role. I was sitting as what we called our first counselor. Okay. So when Ed uh, ended up moving up or moving on in his role, I ended up bumping up to rep to take his position. So then that's when all of all of my uh, portfolios just just expanded. I mean, looking after things like like infrastructure on reserve, um, housing, um, social services, child welfare, 
I mean, having to learn now not only just the my realm that I lived in for the past few years, but now the entire organization and everything that we work on. So it was uh, quite an eye-opening experience. So has your experience with economic development and training informed kind of now looking at some of these other portfolios? Um, yes and no. I mean, a lot of it, I mean, it's a matter of building the capacity and finding, you know, the proper people to help, I mean, build your departments and administer these programs. A lot of it was just, just totally learning of how, how things work. I mean, even looking after, I mean, looking after all the finances, understanding on how the, all the budgets work. Mm -hmm. I mean, for us, I mean, just for the Red Rock Band, I mean, when it comes to this summer and we take on all our summer students and contract staff, we'll have upwards of 150 staff, wow. including our other businesses that we own. Mm -hmm. So just knowing all the dynamics of that and being now the, the figurehead for the First Nation, I mean, there's a lot of times now where people just come to see you with their general day-to-day -day issues. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, being more approachable, being, uh, being more um, uh, empathetic, I mean, all those different things had to, had to really weigh in. They had to, they had to happen fast because it wasn't like it was a two-week waiting period. He got elected on a Saturday, so the next, the next mo on Monday, I started, so, yeah. Uh, so you didn't even run for chief, and here you are, oh my gosh! Well, yeah, well, I, well, the way, actually, for the Red Rock Band, the way that we do our elections is that everyone runs. If you put your name in, okay. or you, sorry, you get nominated, and if you, if you stay in, whoever gets the most votes at the election time becomes chief, and then first councillor is the next amount of votes, so... I mean, back in September of 2017, I mean, Ed beat me out for for, I mean, for highest votes. I mm -hmm. came second, so I knew that the the community supported it, the idea. So I mean, it was that part was uh, was a lot more welcoming. So, how do you now balance kind of economic development and kind of community development within the community? Um, you know, the biggest thing that we've invested in is just getting good staff. I mean, we, 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 there are a lot of times I have to go advocate at all those different levels, mm -hmm. but at the same time, and if we didn't have the people that actually could sit there and, and put the ideas to paper and put the numbers on there to actually start figuring this out, we, nothing would ever happen. So we're breaking ground on a, on a six-unit elders complex this summer. Uh, we've got continual development and infrastructure, uh, new businesses starting. Like, I mean, all those things are great, but it's just taken that good staff to get us there. So I am so proud of, uh, of all the members of the Red Rock Band. I mean, the, the ones that are so, have such an entrepreneurial spirit of starting their own businesses, but plus the ones also that work for us, the dedicated staff that really, that really push our interests to the forefront. So for instance, now on the six unit uh, uh, housing piece you're doing, is it gonna be built by folks that are members of your band? Designed and built. So actually we have an engineer that's a Red Rock Band member designing it. Uh, our Red Rock Band members construction company is going to be constructing it. And plus our own company that the Red Rock Band owns, the Nipigon Red Rock Plumbing and Heating and Electrical, will do all the HVAC and, and electrical. So I mean all of these projects now we're doing, we've invested into the capacity that now we hire them or mm -hmm. ourselves to do it. So it, it's, it's, it's been a great investment and now we're really seeing the fruits of it. And is this normal in terms of what's happening on uh, First Nation communities or are you guys kind of breaking ground here? Uh, each First Nation is going to have their own priorities and how they see things. Uh, for us, I mean, investing into education uh, was always key, making sure that we had uh, people taking advantage of, of, of education while it's there. Uh, but also being willing to invest back into them once they become an operating business. So, I mean, for us, this was our model. Uh, it was a model that we didn't start as the council now. I mean, the previous years have, mm -hmm. uh, but other First Nations, I mean, have similar models that, uh, that they utilize. And I mean, if you can, the best thing you can do is hire yourself for a job. Well, and that makes sense, but I, I know we've had debates here in Thunder Bay of uh, do we hire that company from out of town who maybe put in a lower bid to do the job or do we hire our local company? And, you know, I mean, there's, there's folks on both sides of that right. debate uh, and, and it's interesting to see how Red Rock has kind of 
uh, chosen that path. Well, and the one thing that we do as well is you have to make sure that everyone is still uh, competent to be able to do the job. Mm -hmm. They they have a value for money, and they can also stick to a schedule. So I mean, is I mean, there are times where we do have to go outside if the scope of the work's too big, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't have the internal capacity. But at the, the beginning, with these smaller companies, I mean, a lot of times it is going to cost a few extra dollars because they are taking on new people to build that capacity. So I know that we deal with that in a lot of uh, larger construction projects mm -hmm. because if you're going to take on three, four new people, you're going to have to have people to mentor them, to train them, and it's also going to be the extra cost when it comes to the uh, to the wages. Mm -hmm. But but somehow there may be longer-term benefits in the community. Correct. You may pa pay more money, but... And in that one company that might have been, you know, let's say 2%, two, 3% higher than a, than a huge company from out of town, once they have that internal capacity, they can get to that same level playing field. So we're just about out of time, Matt. If people want to get a hold of you and find out more, uh, what's the best way to do that? Um, email would be number one. Um, matthew.dupuy at rib.ca uh, and if not I mean our office line is 807-887-2510 and my extension is extension 236 and I'm always open for phone calls for emails to, have to continue conversation. Matt thanks so much for coming on the show sure appreciate it and I uh, want to remind folks uh, check us out on Facebook Community Conversations stay safe and see you again next week.